In Psalm 6, we hear the cry of one who is in anguish. Have mercy on me, Lord, because I am frail. Heal me, Lord, because my bones feel fragile. Like so many of the Psalms, I can watch a person read them. And I can also watch that person nod because they know the hurt, they know the pain, they know very well that cry unto the Lord, have mercy upon me. The good news of that psalm that as it continues on, the person declares, I know that God has heard my prayers. I know that God will respond. Sometimes it is difficult to cry out to the Lord, have mercy. And yet by faith we can declare that God has heard our cries and that God will respond. Let us begin our time of worship. Please join me in the responsive call to worship on the screen. Lift up your heart, O people of the Lord. We shall honor the Lord with all our lives. Let the people rejoice in the great, gracious work of God. In response to the goodness of God, we shall sing, celebrate, and serve. Let us worship the, God, the Lord. Please stand as you are able and join in singing him now. Thank we all our God.
people a spirit of pardon and peace. We desire to be made clean, set free from everything that keeps us from knowing you. Move among us this day and allow for your gifts of grace to be met with words and songs of genuine gratitude. It is easy to accept the gifts and to forget the source of our joy. Yet life's true joy is found in offering a living witness to your generous spirit. This we share in the name of the Incarnate One, Jesus Christ. Amen. staff here at Cypress Creek. It's my honor to be in worship with you this morning. If you are a first time visitor, we are glad that you chose to worship with you and we sincerely welcome you. We ask you to visit the Welcome Center out in the lobby after service and we have a gift for you. And for visitors and members alike, there's a blue card in your worship guide. Please fill that out for us. Um, Give us a little contact information on the front, and especially on the back, share your concerns, your prayer concerns, so that we may be in prayer for you, and your joys too, so that we may celebrate with you. Those are so important to us. We take those very seriously here at Cypress Creek. Later in the service, when we come forward for communion, you'll have a chance to place these blue cards in the offering plates up front. Now it is time to greet one another, so introduce yourselves by your first name as you move around and shake a hand, give a hug, greet one another in Christian love.
Good morning. It is good, like every Sunday, to be in worship with you, but what a glorious morning greeted us this day. I want to first uh, add my welcome to the one that Sheila shared earlier, reminding you of those blue cards, always saying, fill them out, let us know you are here, placing them in the offering trays later, unless you're thinking about joining, and then we say keep a hold of it, you can give it to one of the elders or you can give it to me after the close of the service. I also want to point out in your bulletin this morning that there is an insert. Uh, One side, it speaks about two luncheons we are going to be having. One next Sunday and one the following Sunday. Next Sunday, Dr. Newell Williams will be here for all three of our services. He is the president of Bright Divinity School, which is up at TCU, Texas Christian University. And uh, after the third service, after the 11 o'clock service, we'll be having a, a simple lunch, box lunches, bringing that in. For anybody who'd like to come in, he's going to be doing a presentation on the future of Christianity in the United States. I've heard him do this presentation before, and it is superb. And it's also hopeful. And so I hope that you will consider participating in that lunch. Let us know if you'd like for us to bring in a box lunch for you. You'll see that on the insert. And then two weeks from today, we will be having uh, our renewal weekend Worship Saturday night, but also Sunday morning. But on Sunday morning, we're going to have one service at 1030. It's two weeks from today. And like we do with every one service Sunday, we're going to do a luncheon afterwards, barbecue. But we kind of need to know how many folks are going to be there. So please sign up. And you can fill out that sheet and place it in the offering trays or drop it by the church office just so that we can make sure that we have a correct count and can make room. But two great events coming up in the life of our congregation. Today we are looking at the Gospel of Luke, the 17th chapter, and I invite you to now hear these words. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee, and he entered a village, and as he did so, ten men with skin diseases approached him. Now keeping their distance from him, they raised their voices and said, Jesus, Master, show us mercy. When Jesus saw them, he said, Go and show yourselves to the priests. As they left, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he had been healed, returned and praised God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. Jesus replied, weren't ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? No one returned to praise God except this foreigner. Then Jesus said to him, get up and go. Your faith has made you well. Here ends the reading. May God's blessings that always abound be blessings that we receive this day in the hearing of these words. You join me in prayer. O home for the outcast, give us grace to seek the well-being of those who live on the edge. Allow each of us to hear of that wonderful and glorious news the news of your healing love, but to also hear again of the responsibility that each of us has to give witness to that news wherever we might go. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. There are a number number of blogs and websites that clergy can go to and share thoughts, concerns, raise questions, or even share a funny story. Well, I was reading one of those blogs this week, and on it, a pastor was telling about an experience that had occurred in worship. His young daughter was out sitting next to his spouse in worship, and the congregation was participating in this prayer time in which there was a response 
that the congregation said numerous times. They would say, oh Lord, have mercy on us. Well, as they were saying that response, the minister's spouse was listening closely to the daughter. And it didn't sound like she was quite saying the right words. But it wasn't until lunchtime later that day that the young girl was asked about what she said. And with great confidence, the young girl said, well, we said, have messy on us. Close, but not quite right. But the one who was writing up the story on the blog noted, I guess mercy can be a bit messy. Those words struck me, and they have stuck with me. The, uh, this idea that mercy can be messy. It can be murky. It can be muddled and muddy at times. Now, don't get me wrong. It is a beautiful word, and it's used often in Scripture by many different people. A word that embodies the desired gift especially for those who are injured, feeling broken, for those who are lost and forsaken, for those who are grieving and those who are feeling guilty. That word mercy is a powerful word. Lord, have mercy on me. And yet the pathway to mercy, the route to this remarkable experience is not always as clear, nor easy, nor swift as we might think. Lord, have mercy. It is the cry of so many in a time of difficult. Lord, have mercy upon me. But the receiving the embracing and the utilizing of that gift that is given can quite often be messier than we might have thought. Parker Palmer, a Presbyterian minister and author, has written a book entitled, entitled Hidden Wholeness. And in that book, he says, wholeness does not mean perfection. It means embracing brokenness as an integral part of life. Wholeness. It means embracing brokenness as an integral part of life. I find those words to be very challenging, in part because I'm a bit of a control freak. At the end of every day, before the sun goes down, I would like to see everything put back into place. I would like to have everything right and healthy and wonderful and beautiful. And I'm guessing most of you would like to see that. And so to think that brokenness and wholeness somehow can go together, it seems a bit strange. Maybe this mercy thing is a bit messier than we might have thought. Last week, I talked about Jesus and his encounter with Zacchaeus and how that encounter changed his life. Today, we, we read about Jesus not encountering one person, but ten individuals. And in that encounter amazing things happened. Ten men who suffered from a disease, an ailment on their skin. Sometimes it is translated as leprosy. But whatever it was that they were dealing with caused them to be outcasts. Outcasts socially and religiously. It forced them, as scripture suggests, to the border, to the edges of society. But not only physically were they ostracized, but religiously. 
there were certain religious assumptions about people with skin disorders. And they were quickly pushed to the far border of God's welcome. They were quickly pushed to the edge of God's acceptance. I'm guessing many of you have seen a, a commercial that's running on TV right now. It is for a new medication for those with psoriasis. And the actors in the commercial, that I can only assume are pretending to have psoriasis, keep on saying the same line over and over. See me. See me. Don't stare at me, but see me. Don't see just the disease. It's something that I have, and it's not contagious. See me. In the days of Jesus, those with visible skin ailments yearned for others to see them to know that the disease was something that they had, but was not something that they were. Have you ever been defined by something you did or something you had? Have you ever been defined by some characteristic that is beyond your control, but others misunderstand it or fear it? Have you ever been defined by misinformation or an outright lie. It's painful. And it's often difficult to really get the truth out there. Misguided suspicions and assumptions can become the defining attributes of a human being, whether those suspicions and assumptions have any truth to them at all. So when Jesus meets these 10 men with skin ailments, it says he met them on the border between Samaria and Galilee, met them on the edge of society, and they approached Jesus, and yet the scripture is quick to point out that they kept some distance, and they cried out to Jesus, Jesus, show us mercy, or Jesus, have mercy on us. It is the request made by men who wanted to be seen. Not as society had seen them, not as the religious institution had seen them, but to be seen with love and respect that would lift them up and not push them down. You can all probably imagine what that desire was like to really be seen. What happens next in the story is often overlooked. And yet it demonstrates that Jesus saw the men as they wanted to be seen. Because Jesus says, go and show yourselves to the priests. Well, in that time period, when a person had been struggling with some sort of physical problem, a skin disease. It was only when they thought they had gotten better that they went to the priest. And the priest then gave blessing and said, you can now return to society. You can now return and begin interacting with other human beings. You no longer have to be pushed to the margins. Jesus sees them. He treats them, he interacts with them, not as those who had been pushed to the margins, not as those who had been disrespected. He sees them by saying, go to the priests. It's as if he does not see their skin disorder. By saying, go to the priest, he sees them for who they are. And only then, as they depart, as they turn around, the scripture says, and they were cleansed. That is the word, or the word that we translate is the word that is usually associated with that declaration, with that blessing of the priests. When one can now re-enter society, when one has been approved to now enter back into some normalcy of life. 
And so for those men, their response was to be overjoyed. They could now return to life as they had previously known it. They recognized in that moment that the social stigma was gone. The religious rejection was no longer present. And they just wanted to celebrate. But one of them, one of them returned to Jesus. Because as the scripture says, he realized that he had been healed. That's a different word than the one used earlier, cleansed. This word means something very different. The other nine, they were thrilled that finally they were being accepted. They could finally remove themselves from the border and re-enter society. But for one, there was the realization of healing, a physical change. And not just that the ailment had been hidden or disguised or masked. No, for this one, there was the realization that something physical had happened, that Jesus had changed him. And that news brought with it gratitude, gratitude that just could not be held back. And he came and he knelt before Jesus, thanking him. Were the other nine who went away wrong? I can't judge them. When you've been rejected for so long, when you've been despised by society, when you've been pushed to the margins, when the reason for all those struggles disappears and you have some normalcy, and once again you can participate in society, I can understand why you become overjoyed, why you kind of forget everything else and run off to celebrate. And yet I've got to believe that even for those nine, who are kicking up their heels because they finally would be welcomed by society, there was still woundedness under the skin. There was woundedness that had come from being told over and over again, you're not welcome, you're unclean. That somehow the disease on your skin represented who you were as a person. Years ago, when I was living in Indianapolis, I helped run an after-school program in the inner city of Indianapolis. And one of the guys I worked with, his name was Muata. Muata was an African-American man. And Muata said on more than one occasion, I have become a proud black man. Not prideful, not arrogant at the expense of others, he would say, but I am proud to be the person God created me to be. But understand, he would go on to say, I am still injured because of the racism I've experienced and continue to experience. I'm still wounded because of self-hatred that I had in my life. So though I am a proud black man, he would say, I'm still a work in progress. What Mawata helped me to understand is that mercy can find its way into our lives. We can receive that marvelous gift from God, but the journey by which we receive and embrace and utilize that gift is pretty messy. It's not like just turning on a light switch. It doesn't just happen overnight. We're not fully healed just because we've touched up against that mercy one time. The story in scripture has one more important segment. Jesus, upon seeing this man who has returned to give thanks, Jesus says to him, get up and go. Your faith has made you well, or it could be translated, your faith has made you whole. This is another word, a different word. Earlier, we had the idea of cleansed. 
that gift that one is allowed to re-enter society, to participate fully as a human being. The second word, healed, which describes a physical change that has happened. And then this word, made whole. The Greek word is sozo, and it can mean saved or delivered or brought to wholeness. But what's interesting about the word is that it is not only a verb, it is in the perfect tense, which in Greek means that yes, wholeness has come, but it still assumes that there is work to be done, that there are still results that have not yet been understood. So yes, I have been made whole, and yes, I am still a flawed and broken human being in need of God. It's messy, yet God gives mercy. It is messy, and yet I remain a work in progress, and yet God continues to pour out that mercy. Today, I turn 50. A few of you wore black in honor or in memory. I don't know what, but thank you for doing that. And those 50 years of life, if, if, if they've taught me one thing, it's how little I really know and how I remain very much a work in progress. For the last almost 20 years of my life, I have been living with multiple sclerosis. And for the most part, I have been a very healthy individual. It's been six years since my last episode, eight years since my last significant episode. But back in August, I was reading an article. It was about a guy who very much had my experience with his MS, had done quite well up until shortly after he turned 51 years old. It was two years previously, but that episode had left him completely disabled, confined to either a wheelchair or his bed. And I must confess that I would like to have been able to say, ah, oh, that's somebody else's experience. I'd like to pretend that I thought to myself, oh, that just happens to someone else. But it affects you. It causes some fear because your mind goes places you'd rather it not go. Lord, have mercy on me. And that amazing gift of God's mercy, God's concern and kindness extended toward me comes in a powerful way and helps to cleanse me from my brokenness. It heals the weakness found within me, both physically and emotionally. And yes, there are parts of me today that feel very whole. Yet, like many of you, probably all of you, there remains parts of us all that still feel wounded, frightened, unsure. And yet God continues to pour that mercy into us. And that amazing gift of mercy, yes, is a bit messy. But I think Parker Palmer may have had it right when he said wholeness does not mean perfection. It means embracing brokenness as an integral part of life. And so today I celebrate and give thanks for the ongoing work of mercy in our lives. God continues to pour that gift out upon us, that demonstration of genuine concern and love for every single human being. But accepting it, embracing it, utilizing it, it doesn't just happen, at least for me, there's daily work. Some days I do better, some days not so much. But the good news for me and for all of us is that God remains patient and God continues to pour out that gift into our lives.
You join me in prayer. God of all creation, you are the giver of all good gifts. Your love is given without condition. Your forgiveness extends beyond every boundary. And your mercy is provided to every wounded soul. We celebrate these gifts. We honor them and and strive to share them with others. Yet our capacity to receive them, to embrace them, to utilize them is never finished. It's messy at times. And it's more of a journey than a destination. And sometimes it feels like we're stumbling forward and stumbling backwards. But you are the one that continues to be steadfast in offering us that gift, that marvelous gift of mercy. And it is in that gift that we come to know true wholeness. Maybe not perfection, but the wholeness of Jesus Christ. And this morning we are mindful of people around the globe who desperately need that gift. People who find themselves in the aftermath of storms and destruction. Sisters and brothers in other parts of the world who are trying to figure out what to do after violence and war. People who simply feel lost and alone. God, we're all so mindful of those in our own community who are in need of prayer. And this morning we lift up Alan and Heather, Robert and Herbie. We lift up Rob and Eileen, Bob and Francis. We lift up Jean and Ray. And we know that by your grace, you continue to pour into their lives your gift of mercy. But where we can help, Lord, where we can be an agent of your mercy, encourage us, empower us, allow us to come alongside those in need and to demonstrate that no matter what, none of us are alone. We offer these words of prayer in the name of Jesus, the one who taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In scripture, we read the words, come all you who are heavy burdened, all you who are carrying a load, come together. And when we do, when we come together, when we come before the Lord, I believe we receive the gifts of mercy and kindness and grace and love. Those things that will help us in that difficulty. But if you're like me, it doesn't just change everything in an instant. It's a process. There's still work. And sometimes when I think I've made a breakthrough it only opens up a door to things that I have not yet previously seen. And suddenly I think to myself, oh, there's still a lot of work to be done on this person. And yet once again, God is merciful, coming in alongside and helping me. And for that reason, we come to this table week after week, recognizing the need for us to encounter that gift of mercy not just once or twice in our life, but on a regular basis. Because mercy can be messy. Because we're people that are imperfect and a little messy. But God remains gracious and kind in the midst of it all. 
And so this day, I invite you to come to the table, to come to the same table we come to week after week after week, but to come to the table with an open heart to receive the gift of God's mercy. Cypress Creek, we partake of this holy meal by intention. So we take the bread and dip it in the cup. We use grape juice and partake of the meal prepared for us. We also have gluten-free communion, if you need that, on the little table down front. All are welcome to come. This is not our table. It's the Lord's table. If you cannot come forward, please raise your hand and we will serve you right where you are. As you come, you're invited to bring your blue cards, ties, and offerings and place them in the offering plates up front on the side tables. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he was gathered in an upper room with his disciples for the last <coughs> Passover meal. The disciples did not understand what was about to happen, so Jesus showed them. He took a loaf of bread he blessed it, and he gave it, broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. In a like manner, later in the meal, he took an ordinary cup of wine, 
And he blessed it and he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, in remembrance of me. For this is the blood of the new covenant shed for you and the many for the forgiveness of sins. And every time you meet together in my name, do this in remembrance of me. When you come to this table and partake of this holy meal, leave your messiness or brokenness here at the table with Christ and leave this table healed and whole, a work in progress, progress with gratitude and love in your hearts for our Savior. Let us pray. God, we join together again and partake of the loaf and the cup in celebration of the life and death and life of Jesus Christ, who during his walk with us adhered to the, closely to the center of your Holy Spirit, sharing with us truth and love and forgiveness for everyone. Help us to find our way into the center of your Holy Spirit and discover the goodness and peace and abundant life that exists there and share it with each other. Amen. Table is prepared. 